Welcome to MindShift. I'm Brandon. In today's episode 10 of our Secular Bible Study series in which we look at 2 Samuel. This one should be able to go by pretty quick as we've done a lot of the groundwork when we covered 1 Samuel. So some of the points we can just outright skip and a lot of what the foundational setup was in 1 Samuel is going to pay off in the conclusion here in 2 Samuel. So there's still a ton to cover. A lot happens even in the second book. We get the finality of King David, which I think is just fascinating. I think again, Saul and David both are two of the most interesting and complex characters that we get in the Bible. Their relationship together is so interesting. But as 1 Samuel ended, Saul died, and now we have just David, and we're going to see his complexity come in. Because in 1 Samuel, David's on the up and up. He is on the rise. He's the heart player, giant killer, the chosen one, the anointed son. And now we're going to see the humanity and the fall of David. You would think we could finally get one Bible hero that is not completely flawed, especially one that is deemed with a heart after God's own heart. But nope. Unless we are seeing exactly what God's heart is like, which is lustful and vengeful and petty and proud, etc. But we'll get to all of that. So, in fact, let's just dive right in. Point one, book overview. Let's try to get some of the pieces in place here. So it picks up exactly where 1 Samuel left off. Saul dies. And the opening chapters of 2 Samuel is David lamenting this. Again, that amazing complex relationship that they shared where he was on the run from the hunt of Saul. Saul hated him, wanted to kill him, was so envious of him. And yet we see David seeing the good parts of Saul, praising God for who Saul was, lamenting Saul's death, etc. So David gets anointed king of Judah. And at this time, all 12 tribes say, hey, David, make us one. Be king of us all. And David goes on this conquest and there's more conquering and more genocide and more warfare and more everything that we've come to expect from these books. But eventually what happens is he takes Jerusalem and in Jerusalem he brings the ark. This is huge. We're getting a permanent place for the first time for what will be the religious center of Israel. So we have the political capital and we have the religious capital. The ark is brought in, the 12 tribes align, David goes out, he's dancing naked, praising God. He's so excited to have this huge culmination of a moment. And there's just a funny little insert here that I can't help but bring up, but his wife, who was Saul's daughter, I think the one he won for the 200 foreskin thing, she sees him dancing naked in front of all the female servants and she's upset, rightly so. He's making a buffoon of himself. And he comes in and she questions him like, what are you doing? You're the king. You can't be doing this, especially with the female servants. You look ridiculous. And David says, I'll do more than this. I will completely deface myself in front of the Lord. Like you've seen nothing yet. And those female servants, lucky them to witness me literally saying stuff like this. The Christians always love to talk about how much David loved God, that he would just be in his presence, naked before him, dancing, not caring what anyone sees. But there's more layers to that. He just chastises her and then God seemingly punishes her by not allowing her to have any children till the day of her death. I think it's just par for the course at this point, but hilarious nonetheless. So again, David is anointed king of all of Israel. They bring in the ark. And at this point, God goes one step further and says, you know what? Let me make a new covenant with you. God loves covenants with all these leading men, but this one is special. This one is a promise of a few things. One, that David's family will reign Israel forever, and that through his lineage, the greatest king yet to be would come Jesus. So then David is so grateful, and we get this new song of gratitude. So this is kind of his second poem here. We have his lament for Saul. Now we have his gratitude towards Yahweh for giving him this incredible blessing. He goes on a rampage after that, this victory conquest of just taking down tribe after tribe after tribe after tribe. And at this height of his conquering and of his blessing and of his favor with the Lord, the Bathsheba thing happens. I'm sure all of you know the story, but very briefly, he's up on his rooftop. He looks down over the city and he sees Bathsheba on her roof. He lusts after her like crazy, finds out who she is, who her husband is. Her poor husband, Uriah, is sent to the front lines in the next battle, which means certain death for him. And then David can swoop in and take her and he does. So they have this affair. We have this murder and we had already been introduced. I skipped this part to a new prophet. So Samuel is gone and Nathan. Nathan is the new prophet advising the king and helping intercede with God, etc. And he comes to David 
And David immediately confesses just, oh man, I know I messed up so bad. Like, I'm so sorry. Let me reason with God. Let me deal with God. Nathan gives him this huge lecture and then we get to David's punishment. I'm going to save the details for when we get to point seven, when we get to the problematic verses and just read to you what Nathan tells David is his punishment from God. There's actually multiple parts, but what definitely happens next is that his child dies. So we'll get to that. We'll talk about it in detail. I think it's one of the biggest issues in this particular book. So stick with me to point seven and we'll get into the details there. But what happens now? It seems like everything is falling down. David's house right after this covenant is now cursed and we see it starting with his son. So his next son with Bathsheba is Solomon, which we know will be the good son that takes the lineage, which is hilarious to me that it comes from Bathsheba because again, David has eight wives and this doesn't even count all of the concubines. I'm sure he has. He ends up having like 18 kids. I think I'd have to check the number on that, but I'm pretty sure eight wives and the next series of sons is where things start to go awry. Before that, we get like a little tiny paragraph where we see that David, after capturing a few more cities, turns them all into slave labor, like exactly how the Israelites were described as the slave labor back in Egypt that was apparently so offensive to God, but now is just exactly what David is commanding this city, this city, this city. But moving on to the sons, and it really starts with Amnon, who sexually abuses his own sister Tamar. Some of the phrases in this story are absolutely sick. We see how messed up things were, so Amnon is just obsessed with his sister. He can't stop thinking about her, but because she's a virgin, he can't figure out how he's ever going to be able to do anything with her. So if she had already been deflowered, no problem, because he wouldn't get in nearly as much trouble once this woman is worthless and broken. But in the state of her virginity, especially as the daughter of the king, this is a little bit too taboo even for this monster Amnon. And again, I should probably save this for problematic verses, but let's get into the details on this one. So he comes up with a plan where he fakes being sick, tells his father David, can you please send Tamar to come and feed me? He sends her in. He still acts like he's too weak to eat. He tells everyone to leave the room except her so that she can come feed him. He says, come closer, come closer. Finally takes her and as he begins to rape her, she pleads with him, don't do this. The shame, what this will do to me. You will be looked at like a fool. Don't do this. And in her pleading, she says, just go ask David. Go ask our father. He'll give me to you, but make it right. So she's even saying like, okay, fine, we'll do this thing. David will bless it. Just do it right as if there's some right way to do that. And he still says no, and he rapes her. And as soon as he's done, you want to talk about maybe the worst case of post-nut clarity that has ever happened in the Bible. It says that he now hated her with a hatred that was more hate-filled than the love that he loved her with in the beginning. Beginning. And immediately he went to send her out. And she says, no, this is even worse. Don't do this. Now that you've taken my virginity, at least, you know, make this honest. And he said, no, get out. And she was desolate in Absalom's house the rest of her days is what the Bible says. So he just completely ruined her. Absalom can't take it. He kills Amnon. And we'll just fast forward here because so much happens with the sons. But Absalom ends up dying when his hair gets caught while he's riding in a chariot because he tried to overthrow David. So he's so pissed that David didn't do anything anything. This is where his hatred starts to burn. He wants to avenge and take over his father's kingdom. Now, how much of this, I wonder, is the will of him versus the will of God? Because one of the curses that you'll see me read that Nathan gave to David when David slept with Bathsheba is that his own house would rise up against him, which looks like that's Absalom. Does that mean that God construed the rape by Amnon to anger Absalom enough to do that? Or did he just harden Absalom's heart? So again, free will issues always just bouncing around everywhere. We're almost done with the overview. Bear with me. But David was out in hiding just like he was during the whole Saul thing when Absalom was trying to take over the kingdom. Absalom dies. David hears about it. He's so sad. Just like he was with Saul. He comes back to his kingdom. He's now back on the throne. The threat of dissension is gone and he's just a broken man. And that's really it. There's still like a whole third of this book left and it's this weird recap that's out of order. It seems to contradict certain things and show David in a different light as a weaker man who needed more help as opposed to this great warrior who was doing all these great conquests. And it's a recap of the entire story between first and second Samuel. And it leads us into David's old age, which is where first Kings picks up our next book right before we get a new king that follows David. So it's just a quick synopsis of kind of the rest of his reign. And it's just sad. There's some interesting literary techniques we'll talk about in point four, but that is the general overview of second Samuel.
point to his authorship and date, really just go back and watch 1 Samuel. This is also going to be the same for 1 Kings and 2 Kings. There's the claim in the Jewish tradition, and still what a lot of people believe is that Samuel wrote all of these. It doesn't make any sense. Samuel's been dead at this point. The best theory out there is the Deuteronomist hypothesis, which just says that it is a combination of both oral and written traditions passed down through generations. Probably compiled after the exile of Babylon, but possibly even earlier than that. We have a pretty specific time frame here. This is like 1010 to 970 BCE, where 1 Samuel is really more like 1050 to 1000. So we're just seeing the progression here through essentially another generation or two. So moving on to point three, historical accuracy, context, background, etc. Again, not a lot of new things to say here. Now that we are officially in the House of David, though, we get the first archaeological Logical evidence. It's the only, so it's a singular one, it's the only extra biblical archaeological find that confirms any part of the story at all. It's a 9th century Canaanite inscription that simply references the house of David. It's called the Teldan Stele or Stele, and it's in the Israelite Museum. You can go Google it and look it up. So finally, after all of this, we have some archaeological evidence. There's never been a doubt that at one point the Israelites, after branching out of Canaan, took control of the central power, which would have been Jerusalem, and it seems to be in line with this archaeological find that we have. Also, we continue to see the warring battles between the tribes. In this book, we get the Ammonites, the Philistines, the Arameans, and the Moabites, which are all historical Canaanite tribes. Some of those were just completely conquered, according to this book, and that's not shown to be true through what we find in archaeology for their tribes. And in some parts, there were alliances made. So we see some political and economical driving factors of the day, which make more sense for what we would expect these tribes to be interacting like at that time. But ultimately, that's about as far as we can take it. Yes, this nation existed. Yes, they were in Jerusalem at this time. Yes, they were at war and also alliance at sometimes with other Canaanite tribes. The rest of the theological implications and some of the genealogies and histories and battles, etc., there's no extra biblical sources for, and we just don't know. So we'll move right on to point four, which is pretty simple literary analysis. There's really two main literary techniques at play. This is a historical narrative, just easy. We have lineages, we have succession from the previous book, we have an accounting of kings within their kingdom, we have who did what to who, who slept with who, who begat who, who conquered who, who made peace with who, etc. So it's just a ton of details. And until you get to that third part of the book, we have a really linear time frame. The second part that's imposed here are the couple songs that we have. Again, the song of gratefulness after the covenant, the song of loss after losing Saul. I'm using the word song, but you could look at these as psalms or as poems. In that third part of the book, we do get a lot of strange structure. Again, it's not linear anymore. It's jumping around. It's using different styles right in the middle of the third part. We kind of get more of David's poetry, but it's a historical poetry. It's just him recounting almost like journal entries of of the better days, when God blessed him, when he was friends with Jonathan, God's grace, God's covenant, God's promise for a better tomorrow. So again, it's this very mournful, we see a very weak and regretful David in the end of this book, but also still trying to hold on best he can to God's promise and covenant. So it is cool because if we're looking at first and second Samuel as one thing and not just second Samuel on its own, what's happening here at the end of the book is kind of a callback to how we started first Samuel with Hannah's poem. And she had these three things that she had kind of laid out about God's grace and God's plan and God's providence. And we see David, even though it's kind of regretful and how he screwed it up, but how God will still take it to fruition, call back to that. So it started way back at the birth of Samuel, even before the birth of Samuel, the mother of Samuel begging for a child. And we've seen that through Samuel and Saul and David and Nathan and David's sons, this ending of that circle. So again, the Jewish writers were very good at this. They were very good at theme about tying things back into each other, about parallelism, about complementing the narrative structures within the stories, etc. So well done, very huge when we're looking at first and second Samuel plot development all the way through. It's such a central point from creation and everything that happened during the Exodus to what we will see with the fulfillment through Jesus's birth and death. This is the middle. David. And so much had to happen to get us here, and so much is going to happen past this point. So let's just move right into the main themes, which are probably obvious at this point, but let's just pull out a couple here. Once again, this is just a theme for the Bible in general, but especially in this book, and especially through a character like David. It was one thing when we painted Saul to be the bad guy, but we start to see Saul's really no different than David. Power corrupts, and there's consequence to that. God keeps giving everyone a chance 
Hey, Moses, you want to lead these people out? Hey, Joshua, you want to lead these people to victory in Canaan? Hey, judges, do you want a shot at this? No? Okay, let's move into the kings. How about you, Saul? How about you, David? How about you, Solomon, etc.? And each of these individuals or groups get their chance at having the power, and each of them fail before God and receive God's consequence. So the consequence for disobedience and or how power corrupts, even in direct connection and anointment by the holy creator of the universe himself. So that was like two. I think in this book we get the theme of really the complexity of human nature, which is cool. We've had characters that were complex. You know, Moses was kind of torn and has an interesting story. Joshua is a pretty one-dimensional character, just about power and conquest. We get a lot of one-dimensional things going on with judges. We see a little bit of complexity with Ruth, but really it's just a survival story at the end of the day. But again, and I've said it, so I won't beat a dead horse, what we see with Saul and David is just that dichotomy of man. Even outside of God playing with them and the issues with free will, we have men torn apart. We have men that love and care and believe and worship and try, but also men that fail and give in and are torn away and doubt, etc. And it's just this real human nature on display. So again, that complexity, I think, is on high display during these two books. And then I think maybe the last theme could be something along the lines of the fulfillment of divine promise or God's providence or sovereignty or however you want to put it. I put a question mark next to it because what I see, and it requires more study here, but as we're going through all of this, I just see a continual breaking of all of the promises that God has put forward for his people. We see him make a covenant, essentially a promise with Saul. So unless these are highly conditional, which apparently they are, we see him not feel like he has to honor these. But the way that he says it, the way that these promises or covenants come about is this is what will happen this is my will. And then we just don't see it. Or we see God so ready to throw it all away and just kill everyone again like he did with the flood, etc. And it's interesting because, yes, if you construe the story just so and you change the lineages, which we'll get to when we get to the New Testament, you arrive at these perfect numbers and these central points with David, Adam, Jesus, etc. But as you're going through the story, if you believe what God is saying about Saul's house ruling forever, Eli's house ruling forever in the priesthood, now it's David's house ruling forever, like forever just doesn't mean anything. Same thing with taking over the promised land. They still haven't conquered everyone. They still don't have complete control. So a lot of these seem hyperbolic on God's part in his initial promise and then it's much less than that or it's open for interpretation or it's open for man's faults to get in the way but there is an idea here of fulfillment that's at play in this book just messy I think so moving right into point six again will be a very simple one because anything that we have said about David's influence whether it's him and Goliath and what that looks like for the Israelite people to hold on to as they've been the underdog so many times throughout history but make their comeback you know we've we've mentioned in first Samuel but a few additional things you can point to in terms of reception and influence for point six from an art perspective I mean even Michelangelo's David you know of all the works that he did this huge central focus on David and that's very common I mean again David gets a ton of credit and I wonder I wonder why I wonder if it's the God saying he's a man after his own heart I wonder if it's just his you know hero story hero underdog story with Goliath he's not a better leader he's not a smarter tactician with the military yes he united the tribes so maybe that's it and established Jerusalem as a religious and political capital, this is really huge for what the end goal of this wandering nomadic tribe and then splintering of tribes and then reunification is. So I can see the prominence there, but in terms of character, there's just murder and genocide and lust and greed. This is just another king. But David is this huge central figurehead in the religion. And a lot of it comes with the messianic promises that are established in this book with the future king that would come and save being Jesus, being the descendant from David. Obviously, it started before David, though. So just to pick him out in the middle of that lineage and make him so prominent, I think is really interesting. And we see because of that prominence, so much influence. So many scenes have been recreated around the rise and fall of David. So many stories have been told in 
and its like and its kind. It's been a huge source of inspiration throughout the ages. So for point seven, we do have some contradictions, which I'll cover. And there's a couple that come because the story is kind of retold in First Chronicles. And in that retelling, we see different things than we see. Now, some of them are simple and some of them are a bit more complex. And then we'll get to the problematic verses. So I won't go on as long here as I normally do because we covered so much in First Samuel. So in this book, in Second Samuel, we see that David was 30 years old when he became king. But in First Chronicles, it says he was seven. Now, some of this could be just differences with him being initially anointed versus when he actually took the throne. But there's also reason to believe that they actually meant he was truly committed king at age seven, which wouldn't have been uncommon for a young individual to be named king. So just issues there that, again, wouldn't be important if we were talking about just history and that we have these different accountings and that people could interpret when his reign actually started at different times. But where the issue really comes in at is that if this is a divine story written or at least inspired by a perfect God, that it shouldn't be this complicated, that we shouldn't have these simple issues. I know this isn't going to be a sticking point for all Christians, but for many, it should be. In this exact same fashion, comparing First Chronicles with Second Samuel, we get a difference in the number of horsemen that David took. So in Second Samuel, we get a smaller number, 700, but in First Chronicles, it's 7,000. Now this absolutely looks like a copyist error. No problem. Does it really matter if it's 700 or 7,000? No, it doesn't. But what this does is it should cause concern for what else was a copyist error, right? Because some things in the Bible that are supposed to be literal have a huge importance to who Jesus was, what Jesus really did, how we're saved, and the big one is prophecies fulfilled. If we can so easily be off by thousands here, what's to say Jesus wasn't dead for four days and it doesn't fulfill the three-day prophecy, right? Like, why are we so eager to believe all of the literal things that we believe if we see literal contradictions when it comes to other literal countings and issues? For all the fundamentalists who think the Bible is inerrant, you're wrong errant. These two things cannot both be true. Is it a small issue and can it easily happen? And do we see this in modern times as well? Absolutely. But again, there aren't modern books claiming to be the divine inspired word of God that we rest our entire salvation and future of eternity on. This should do better. But again, so many contradictions. I'll just list some off rapid fire and then we'll get into some of the problematic passages here. And then one other source of major contention. But we have, you know, how did Saul die? Did Saul die with his sons? The birth order of David sons is unclear. Once again, we see contradictions in this very book about if it's okay and if God allows both human sacrifices and also punishing people for the sins of others, specifically with inheritance. If God tempts or doesn't tempt, how many mighty men David had or didn't, how much something cost, how many years the famine was, like all kinds of things we see different answers for here. And we see this in every single book so far. How anyone can say the Bible is perfect is just beyond me at this point. But let's get to a really interesting question here, which is when David does something he's not supposed to do, he does a census, there's some highly questionable wording. Let's dive into this. It's in 2 Samuel 24. So let me just read you. This is David's census. This is the ESV version. Here's 2 Samuel 24, verse 1. Again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he incited David against them, saying, Go number Israel and Judah. So let's stop there. We'll talk about the implications of doing the census and counting the men anyways, but we're going to compare it with 1 Chronicles 21.1. Then Satan stood against Israel and incited David to number Israel. And again, if you think, oh, maybe it's a different census, and this is a telling of a different story. No, if you read the context on both and what happens next, like, so David said to Joab and the commander of of the army, go number Israel. And again, if we go back to 2 Samuel, the following verse is, go number Israel and Judah. So the king said to Joab, like, I mean, this is the exact same story. And the difference here between Satan and the anger of the Lord, this is huge. Now you can read commentary on this all day, but if you don't have someone trying to make apologetics for it, and you read this Bible, our canon, what we have, what we're supposed to believe is for all people for all time. What we're supposed to believe is inspired and inerrant, by the way, which it clearly is not. This is a 
huge issue. I covered it very slightly when I did the video on satanic hiddenness because even having the word Satan used in the Old Testament is very, very interesting. We get so few iterations to it and sometimes mistranslations. Sometimes it was better known as the accuser. Like in Job, this is an accuser that's coming before the Lord, freely moving back and forth in and out of heaven. Would that really be Satan? Certain translations have said Satan, certain have said accuser, but this one in First Chronicles is where we see Satan's name really used used on its own, seemingly translated correctly here. I will tell you the main Christian apologetic I think is beyond weak. They're saying, well, it doesn't have to be one or the other. God's angry, so he's allowing Satan to incite, but that's not what it says. This is a direct, this, like, this could not be more simple. The anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he, we know how to read, right? He goes back to God. This is how grammar works. So in one verse, you have God doing the inciting, and in another verse, you have the devil doing the inciting. Or Satan, I should say. I th I don't I don't I don't think it gets any more clear than this. So I'd encourage you go read about it on your own. Look at the different commentaries. If you want there to be an excuse, you're going to find one because people have made it their life's mission to excuse all the things that are obviously wrong in this text. I know all the excuses for this, all the different wordplay you can do, all the different translations, all the different grammar. It doesn't hold up to me. I think that this is an issue. Now, the only thing that I would give it is that all this time, God was his own enemy. God's anger is Satan. Now, this doesn't make sense, of course, with the rest of what scripture says about the fall of Lucifer, how the devil works, who the devil is, that the devil will be destroyed, that the devil deceives, etc. Like, this can't be also part of God's nature. But I think it's a really interesting to think about that what if all this time, all the evil things, all the temptations, all the deceit, all the lies were just God's bipolar side when he's angry. Like, do you see what I mean? There's no good way to excuse this. This either completely destroys the foundations of how we understand God's character to be, or we have a real, inexcusable contradiction in the Bible. So please, Christians, go ahead and tell me how I'm wrong and explain this one away, but I stand by major issue here. All right, let's read some problematic verses, though. Let's get back to the one we almost covered earlier, which is when Nathan is telling David what his punishment will be. So this is going to be chapter 12, verse, we'll do 10. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house. Because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife, thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house. Here's where it gets really dicey. And I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this son, S-U-N. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. Again, S-U-N. I think it's very strange. We, we can get into that another time. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord has put away your sin and you shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. Then Nathan went to his house. So we have a few things here. We have, first of all, we're supposed to see God's good grace here in forgiving David. And the way that he's forgiven David is by not killing David. So what does God do instead? Well, God needs David because he just made a covenant with David. So if he can't kill David, which would be the actual punishment for this sin. So we also have God going back on his word because this is clearly outlined. David should be put to death for this sin. But God someone who is so graceful, also always has to be appeased. So he'll put it off onto other things. So the first thing he'll do is he'll take seemingly all of David's wives and have them raped in public to publicly shame David, because that's all women are good for. This would bring dishonor to David by having his wives raped publicly. This is not the first time we've seen God use rape as punishment. This to me, man, I need to make a hierarchy of issues here, but rape as punishment, I think might be one of the most unjust things that happens in the Bible. Because these women that are getting raped have nothing to do with the issue, and the men who are going to do the raping, how does that work? Does God just have men on standby? that are always willing to do this for him? Or is he controlling these men in some way? Like how does free, answer me, how does free will work when a woman is raped, meaning against her will here, 
by a man as punishment. And for it to happen, there will be other people involved, and all Israel will know because it's public. So this isn't like some hyperbole. This is this is insane to me. And yet, God's not done with his wrath. If he's not going to take it out on David, the public rape of all of these wives is not enough. Let's start killing children. I covered this verse in my video about abortion where I replied to inspiring philosophy who says that God doesn't ever do abortion and though he absolutely does with fetuses, this is a newborn. And not only does he kill this newborn, he makes it last seven days. The following verses are David fasting and crying and begging God for grace. Don't do this. We don't see him say boo about his wives that are getting raped, but he is on the floor covered in ash on his knees, not eating for seven days, completely distraught. And this baby is just tortured for seven days until it's dead. Tell me how this is God's grace. Tell me how it's God's love. Tell me how it's God's justice. I, I don't understand. I've literally lost count in how many times God has said, I will no longer punish children for the sins of their father. What the hell is this then? God can't make up his mind here. There's no context that excuses this. There's no, well, the translation really says this. It's beyond clear. God kills David's child as punishment for David's sin, and it takes him a week to do it, probably because he was too busy getting all the rapes organized. Like, Think back to the last nine books that we've covered and all the horror. But even if everything was perfect until now, this verse alone disqualifies God from worship, disqualifies God from claiming himself as just and merciful and righteous. If you're a Christian and you made it this far and you want to argue about the whole God versus Satan, 2 Samuel 24 thing, fine, ridiculous, fine. How do you excuse this? How do you turn around and tell your kids God is good, God loves you? You either completely ignore this, you turn a blind eye, you're willfully ignorant, or you don't care, which makes no sense to me whatsoever. It's verses like this that made it impossible for me to lie to my children about who God is. Okay, so we're going to actually jump back to 2 Samuel 24 for the Lord's judgment of David's sins. So God sends Gad to go to David and say, hey, I'm going to punish you. But since God is so playful and fun, he says, you can choose your punishment. Here's a few versions. And let me just read to you what follows. Thus says the Lord, three things I offer you. Choose one of them that I may do it to you. Shall three years of famine come to you in your land? Or will you flee three months before your foes while they pursue you? Or shall there be three days pestilence in your land? Now consider and decide what answer I shall return to him who sent me, God. Then David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercy is great. But let me not fall into the hand of man. Essentially, David chose to let the people suffer the consequence so that David didn't have to directly. So the Lord sent a pestilence on Israel from the morning until the appointed time, and there died of the people from Dan to Beersheba 70,000 men. And when the angel stretched out his hand towards Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord relented from the calamity and said to the angel, It is enough. Now stay your hand. I mean... <laughs> I'm I'm just it's it's baffling to me that Christians have this in their Bible. And here it says it that David who sinned either because Satan told him to or God told him to, we can't even know because of this insane text counts people. And that angers God so much that like a genie, he gives three negative wishes, which David can choose from about how he'll take his punishment. And like a coward, David sends it to the people. And you think maybe it's going to be a couple. It's 70,000 people died. It wasn't even done. 70,000 wasn't even the plan. It was going to go on. But David pleads with God to stop. If you keep reading, builds an altar, makes a sacrifice. God loves that shit and stops it all. It's bananas. And so I'll stop there. I mean, there's more. This, this book is as messed up as the rest of them. But please, Christians, tell me why you're okay with this. It's so clear who this God is if he were real. And it's so clear that this God isn't real. So what are we doing every Sunday at church? Seriously, who are you worshiping? Where do you get the lyrics for these songs about good, good father? Bad, bad father. I don't get it. But I'm, I'll, I'll stop. Thank you for watching. Uh, let's end there. Have a great day, I guess. We'll see you on the next one for First Kings. It's not going to get any better, guys. The Old Testament's pretty messed up. 
And maybe that's the excuse that all you Christians are telling yourself, that it doesn't matter, that somehow this is a different God, that Jesus came to change things. Nope, 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 and no. And I'm excited to get into the New Testament so we can continue to see that this God is exactly who this God still is, that Jesus is God. He was there at the beginning. Jesus, just as much as God, if you believe the scriptures in your precious New Testament, claims as much. He was there. When the angel stretched out its hand to destruction and killed 70,000 men and wasn't done and got calmed down by the scent of burning flesh going up into the air from the altar of David. It was Jesus just as much as it was God. He's not your buddy. He's not your best friend. He's not helping you find your car keys. He's a vindictive, petty, jealous murderer. No argument. If you believe your Bible, those are the facts. So worship out of fear. Worship out of self-preservation. Do not worship out of some messed up position of grace and mercy and love. It's wrong. All right. I guess I wasn't done. I'll be done. Thank you. Have a great day. I'll see you on the next one. And until then, keep thinking. I wanted to personally thank my top tier iconoclast patrons, Sean Skaggs and Jason Rollins, and my atheist advocate patron, Jared Nichols, for their incredible generosity. And also a big shout out to my secular scholar patrons. All other patrons are listed in the description of each video. Please consider joining this group if you enjoy these videos or believe in my mission. Thanks and have a great day.